that's how you're gonna get it. <laughs> um, we wanna thank our sponsor for today's session, Tesco. Tesco is a leading supplier for the product and chain solutions to enable organizations to build, use, maintain, and wrestle cellular mobile communications, Wi-Fi, machine-to-machine, -machine, Internet of Things, and wireless backhaul systems. I would like to introduce to you our moderator for this session. Her name is Sandra Wendelkin. She's the editor of Mission Critical Communications and Radio Resource International. She has more than 19 years of wireless technology reporting and editing experience. Before joining, rejoining Radio Resource Media Group in 2005, she worked for Crane Communications as an interactive manager and editor of rcrnews.com, which many of you um, have heard of. It's an online news source that services RCR wireless news. From 1999 to 2002, she was the editor of Global Wireless, also a Crane publication. She previously served as an editor for Radio Source International and the Public Safety Report within Mission Critical Communications. So she has a lot of experience in this space. Along uh, with her today, we have mail samples from Cadstar Inc., Ken Baker from the University of Colorado at Boulder, Jim Neville from Catherine, and Battalion Chief Kevin Nida from the Los Angeles Fire Department. Uh, we'll turn it over to them to give a better introduction of themselves. Over to you, Sandra. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Um, so welcome to the panel today. This is a good, great topic on public safety and HET nets. Um, as as the intro introduction said, I'm the editor of Mission Critical Communications. Um, we've been covering the communications, uh, public safety communications industry for more than 30 years. Um, we have a print magazine, um, also a robust website at mccmag.com, and many other online products and information. So I encourage you to visit our website and check out our magazine for more information. Um, we have an impressive group of experts on this panel today. Um, I'm going to let them each introduce themselves and then we will jump into a panel discussion about uh, the issues surrounding public safety and HET nets. Um, so Kevin, why don't we start with you and give okay, a... thanks. All right, uh, my name is Kevin Knight, I'm a Battalion Chief of Los Angeles Fire Department. I'm assigned to our Communications Division and I had the honor of putting together our group to address the uh, fire prevention, what we now know as Fire Prevention Requirement 105, which addresses bi-directional amplifiers in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jim Neval. I'm the President and CEO of Katrine USA. We're the number one LTE vendor in the world and provide primarily into the carrier space and we're from macro cell down to small cell and DAS equipment. How do you do? I'm Ken Baker. I'm currently with the University of Colorado, and uh, prior to that, I was in the cellular industry with Qualcomm and some other vendors, uh, primarily working on the indoor and building space, and we can talk about that some more, too. Hi, my name is Mel Samples. Um, I am currently a consultant, most working predominantly with public safety, dealing with their uh, planning and uh, strategic system deployments. Uh, I've been, uh, or I, I was prior to this uh, stint, uh, public safety practice manager for AT&T Mobility, and uh, have in past lives done a, a lot of work with in-building systems, uh, the carriers, carrier deployments, and uh, it's just a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I think the first topic we should we should address is. Some of, some of the differences um, between public safety HET net systems and commercial HET net systems. Um, I know, Jim, you have obviously experience in both. Mel, you have experience in both. Maybe one of you wants to kind of give an overview of some of the differences in terms of technology and, and ownership and, and cost. Well, Probably the interesting thing that, that I saw here again today, it kind of reinforces what I've been seeing for the last few years, is a distinct misunderstanding between the uh, business community and public safety of what the requirements are. 
Um, actually, the, the chief has known me for a number of years, so I can say this here, and I'm sure he won't beat me. But um, the, the challenge that, that we face is that public safety wants everything faster, better, more reliable, and free. Uh, <laughs> does that pretty well cover it, chief? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but indeed, there are some unique requirements, and there, there are uh, misunderstandings about things like spectrum, what's in use, what's needed, what are, what are, what's public safety trying to do. And public safety actually has a challenge among themselves to try to, to become organized and, and create an organized face and, um, and discussion with the rest of industry, with the engineers, with the equipment manufacturers of what their requirements are and how they need to go about doing it. So. From Katrine's viewpoint, since we have to deal with the commercial side much more than anything else, we're finding this to actually be a very interesting point in time in regards to what public safety is coming to the marketplace, plus the business case for DAS solutions. Today, the carriers are starting to backpedal a little bit in regards to being the forefront, being the people that have to sign off the check to get these things built. So we're looking for enterprise owners, venue operators, et cetera, be the ones to basically provide the infrastructure. They have to basically put everything into place. <coughs> at the same time, now you have public safety brought in. So now they're looking at a potential requirement, we'll use that phrase, where they will put in a public safety device, which essentially looks like the DAS system. And now they can look to maybe augment that even further to bring in a commercial viable DAS system to meet the carrier demand. This allows them to base, to look at a revenue model, return on investment, either shared revenue with the carrier, uh, maybe some sort of operating expense with the tenants. This is allowing them an avenue to maybe address the issue of, okay, it's not for free, but I might be able to get something out of it, and at the end of the day, provide a service to my tenants that are beyond just safety. And the, the fire service perspective is that, you know, we care about the immediate dangerous to life and health environment. So if we get a, an auto fire in the third floor of a subterranean basement, obviously you got a lot of people parking your cars. If the sprinkler system doesn't hold that at bay, it's still going to generate a lot of smoke, a lot of dangerous uh, uh, output. And we've got to go down and put that fire out. So we've got to have communications back to the street. Uh, we look at it very simply. If our radio system can't talk point to point back to the street, we've got to have a mechanism, some kind of backhaul to, uh, to bring us back out. The commercial side, the cell phones and all that are all what we call nice to have. But what we're looking at is, is our, our uh, uh, radio system to be able to work and get us the help that we need and to be able to help you. You know, it's tough being on a panel when you're talking life and death, and I'm bringing a business case. I know. <laughs> yes. But I want, but I want to, I'll put, a, I'll put a plug in here, though. When we developed our standard, we were very business friendly. And we brought a lot of people in from the business community also that are involved in many of the high rise projects downtown to see what they could afford, to see what was reasonable to them. So we mirrored our standard after the uh, uh, current red line, uh, our metro rail uh, subway system. And so the same eight channels we have in that system, we require to be put placed in these other buildings. So it, it uh, is, is cost effective. We don't, we don't want to uh, overburden somebody uh, for, for cost, but we also need to have a safe environment to be able to help you in as well. Well, as the university guy, I, I wanted to pontificate for a while and stroke my beard and point out how the first two gentlemen <laughs> were mentioning the flow of money and how it affects the decisions that get made and how these systems get put up. And, uh, it is something that becomes increasingly obvious. And then there's the, this indoor space, public safety, het nets in general, maybe all of it, is where money and technology meets to solve some of these problems. And it all gets amplified by exactly what Jim just mentioned. They're, they're life and death things. I, I want this stuff to work when I have my heart attack here and uh, make, make it all go. So that, but the funding is, you know, the funding from the commercial side is somewhat obvious. There's a, a flow of money. The funding from the public safety side is not so obvious. So that's where they meet. And so let's talk a bit about that. How, if, if, a, if a building needs a public safety system, who, who generally begins the process? Is it the public safety agency, the building owner, the commercial carrier? Talk a little bit about the process for getting a public safety um, DAS network in the building. It, it all starts in the planning and permitting process. And so if you want to build a building in the city of LA that's over three stories or over 50,000 square feet or it has more than three floors of subterranean parking, 
those are three little triggers that will trigger our permit people to kind of point you in the right direction to get somebody to consult with you to make sure that, that uh, A, that you, you may or may not need the system. If you're close to a, a radio site and you have good coverage and you do the testing, you don't need to put in a system. If you, by that engineer's, um, uh, in a, in a, their professional engineer's opinion, that you're going to need that. And most of the folks that work in L.A., they work in downtown. They, they worked in the industry, you know, like, like uh, Mel's worked in the industry for, what, 25, 30 years. Uh, this is my 35th year on the fire department, and I started in downtown in, in the early 80s. So, you know, we all know the topography in the area, and um, so we know where we're going to need it, where we're not. So I think that's really the, the, the main thing is to make sure that they know early on they can factor that cost in. When you're looking at a billion-dollar project, and you may have to spend you know, a few hundred thousand on a system, uh, it, it's easy to put it in the front end. It, it's really expensive. And we've seen building owners have to go through this where they didn't do it. Uh, they later found out they needed it, and then they had to spend a lot of money with concrete coring and a bunch of stuff that would have been much cheaper just to do in the very beginning of the design phase. Senator, I think it's also driven by expectations and what's going on in the, in the rest of the business community. Um, we all have cell phones today. Um, I'm sure uh, nobody here remembers what their smartphone looked like in 2006, like 10 short years ago, because there were no smartphones on the market in 2006. So in 10 short years, we've moved to smartphones, we've moved to high-speed data as consumers. The public safety community is grappling with those same technologies. How does their job become safer and better? How do they protect us uh, better than they ever have before? How do they make sure they go home safe every night? So we, we have this, this confluence of expectations and technology that's all coming together right now, and, and very rightly so. And, and so you have those drivers uh, that now cause public safety to come up with standards. Under what conditions do they need to use these technologies? And that's what they need to communicate with us, and we need to communicate with them what are the things that are going on in the future, and, and how can we go about making their lives better and safer? I was going to add to this that I've, been work I've only been working in the public safety space for about seven or eight years, and um, I wanted to comment on, not to pick on my fellow panelists, but Jim's comment about the, the, the process in Los Angeles is actually fairly well defined, I'm sure, because of his work, and it's rational, and it makes sense, and I mean, it, but I, out there in Colorado, let me tell you, it ain't, it ain't the same. And, and I, I wanted to throw that in this mix as well because we're all from different parts of the country. They, it is all over the map as far as the requirements for public safety and sometimes it even, I think I was talking with both of these gentlemen this morning, it sometimes depends on who you talk to within the same fire department, uh, what kind of requirement or what you'll be told about what you have to do. And I think we're at the cusp as all of the technology comes to play that's now living in our pockets, uh, that the, the public safety world is, is grappling with how to apply this to all of the places they need to be, because they need to be just about everywhere, and the cells are getting smaller. It used to be that 100 watts and a big antenna up on the building was gonna do the right thing, and that just ain't true anymore. Do you agree? Yeah. Absolutely. The, one of the main issues, if you're a building owner, a venue operator, I mean, it's a carrot and a stick. Uh, instead of viewing public safety as a requirement and expense you have to build into it, if, if you could take the step, know that, okay, this is what it would cost for me to get a foundation put in place, a system. From there, I might be able to potentially grow on it. The initial cost outlay becomes much more palatable. But the difficult part is if you have multiple locations, multiple states, multiple counties, uh, it, it's going to change overall. Uh, we were just having a discussion before everyone came in. You know, states are different, counties are different. Heck, you can have cities are different, depending on what it is. You know, the goal I, I we hope for, at least from the vendor community, companies like FirstNet, they're coming out. Maybe they can't regulate, but at least maybe be a proponent to say. Let's try to build this in a parameter. Let's try to have everything look something like this. This would allow acceptance to be happening much more readily. You can basically then grow from there. Uh, economies of scale is a wonderful thing. Let's use it to our advantage and try to focus on that. 
Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about some of those standardization efforts and code that, that are out there. Um, I know the Safer Buildings Coalition is working to, to kind of standardize some code that could be used potentially nationwide, but it is very localized right now. Um, and Kevin can speak to that in Mel as well because they've, they've dealt with that in LA. Yeah, you know, we, um, again, we took a common sense approach. I uh, looked at uh, our I code. The city of LA for years had its own fire code, and recently we adopted the international fire code. So now we're an I code city. Uh, we also looked at NFPA 72, and we blended those two together. There are a lot of uh, standards nationally on, on what the system has to do. What we found was the, the difference is that it wasn't always applied to the same standard, meaning that you know how many square feet, how many stories, that sort of thing. So I think that's really the key, and that's that's got to be almost city driven, because you could require something in a city that maybe there aren't that many buildings that are that tall. If you know high rises, you don't need a high rise standard. Uh, we didn't want to uh, uh, make it too restrictive on apartment owners. If you have a three story apartment building, two floors of uh, subterranean parking, and now they're putting in you know hundred thousand dollar system. So that doesn't really make sense. So again, if we could talk simplex or point to point from that uh, subterranean parking out to the street, out to the fire engine, where, where we could get more help if we needed it, we thought that would be reasonable. So that's how we came up with some of these. So they were they were really kind of incident driven or scenario driven. And then again, the, the real key to I think our success, uh, because now we have a standard. Uh, you know, we had people, depending on who you ask on what day, you might get a different answer. Matter of fact, you probably would get a different answer. So we want to make sure we're giving the same answer, but getting the uh, manufacturers involved, getting the business community involved, getting the consultants who really do the engineering involved, and then um, you know guys like me who, who go on these calls and are responsible for people that go on the calls, and then the inspectors who actually inspect the building, because we, we tied this to our annual fire protection testing code. So uh, basically there's something to, to connect it all together, um, and, it, and it made sense. And what was really interesting is that uh, when we were done at the end of the day, everyone kind of agreed. So we're kind of like waiting for you know, this big disagreement and, and, uh, and everyone agreed. So we thought it was, it was uh, we, we'd done well because even those who wanted to, they're kind of always the devil's advocate. You see them come to a meeting and okay, what are they gonna, gonna come complain about? And now they go, well, you know what? I, I got nothing. So <laughs> then we thought maybe we were too, it, was, it, was, it wasn't restrictive enough, but, but we went back in our notes and found that, that we were satisfied with that. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see as time goes on, buildings get built incidents occur, it will really test it. Um, and again, this isn't really new for us. We have Staples Center, we've got Nokia, Getty Center, uh, miles and miles of underground on the red line. So we've been doing this for a long time and we have quite a bit of experience on how it works and how to, how to uh, mitigate some of those issues. And how long did that process take for you to get that consensus? You know, it, it, took, uh, it took about three months. Okay. That's all it took really, is that okay. uh, we had some people who Mel's laughing, was it four? It was really, in, in, in city time, it was milliseconds. Yeah. <laughs> it was, was milliseconds. I was afraid to ask. I'm glad yeah. she did. It's like Yeah, but I think three or four months, and, uh, and really that was just scheduling meetings and getting input and, and working around everyone else's schedule. I think when you look at the number, I think we had like, what, six or seven meetings mm -hmm. and probably a lot, of, a lot of email back and forth. But if you look at 510 and you look at NFPA 72 and you blend the two together, and you see what makes sense for your community, you can come up with a pretty good standard fairly quickly. Gosh, Chief, I hate to do this to you. I just have to correct you on one thing. <laughs> the, uh, it, it took LA City Fire Department about 10 years to develop the standard. Well, it took, for, them, it for, took them nine and a half years to decide that they were going to have a standard. To do the standard. <laughs> it took less than six months to develop it. So oh. we, we try to be like the next I'll add, you know, in Congress. So right. You tried to run the committee that way, not, not you know, the other way. <laughs> um, one of the things that's happening, um, and, and I, I'd like to go back and, and revisit one thing. Um, Chief mentioned simplex operations, and uh, this is th this whole terminology, and the terminology that's used uh, across the industry and used by public safety is constantly in a disconnect state. Um, simplex, to those of you who are IT network engineers, it's not the same as peer to peer. Because when he talks about simplex, he's talking about mission critical, which isn't the same mission critical as what we hear about from the carriers. Um, his definition of mission critical is when everything else is broken, 
there's been a volcano in downtown Los Angeles, everything is busted, they can still do their job. That's mission critical. Um, we know that cellular networks can't get hardened entirely to that level. Um, there's just, there are certain things that will break um, under certain conditions and you just can't do anything about it. So we've got some disconnects that we also need to work out in the industry, how we're talking about things and make sure that we really are talking about the same stuff. Um, <coughs> well, I'll let you go back to the next question. Well, if, I could, if I could jump in on that, the, uh, no, what Mel says is correct. You know, for, for years in the fire department, most agencies operated on an analog conventional system, not, not digital, not trunked, just point to point or point to a repeater on a hilltop and back, and that worked great. And then as digital technology and, and the, the need for more communication advanced, trunking systems were developed and digital systems were developed. Um, I served for 10 years as president of the State Firefighters Association and being involved in technology for a long time, we found it, it was important to develop what we called our 16 P25 digital watchouts. And it wasn't to criticize P25 digital, it was to train firefighters on the watchouts. If you lose the network, like if you lose the network on your cell phone, you're not gonna make a call. If you lose the network on a digital trunk radio system, we're not gonna be able to make the call. So what we've recommended is that in all systems that are digital, you maintain a certain amount of analog spectrum, and that analog spectrum be allowed to be used in simplex or point-to-point -point mode. Most fires from the street to where the fire is, is under a couple hundred feet. Typically, maybe under 100 feet. That's really what we call our IDLH, or our immediate dangerous to life and health, where we're gonna get a firefighter trapped, Building's gonna collapse, rip's gonna collapse, and we've got to not go through the front door. We will cut a hole through the side of the building to get that firefighter out. So that's why it's super important for us to be able to communicate and know where people are, but also have that reliability. The range is great, the efficiency is great, spectrum efficiency is great, but at the end of the day, we've gotta be able to talk from the street to where that person is to rescue those people that are trapped or get that firefighter out and make sure they go home safe. Right, and it's very true. You rely on mission critical voice networks like you described every day. Um, the industry is, there's an initiative underway called FirstNet that is um, working toward um, public safety to be on LTE for data networks. That, that process is gonna take many years. Um, but there are people like Ken who are doing research on public safety LTE and in building coverage. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that, Ken, and the, the research you've done in that arena. Um, thank you, I will, uh, which is why I'm here, thank you. Uh, so yeah, this is why the university guy is on this panel, is because I uh, am just up the road from the Public Safety Research Center out of NIST, it's about two kilometers from my, from my office, and they began looking at LTE. I had just come out of the cell phone industry, I, I, could, I could spell LTE, and I began to talk to them about in-building coverage, because I'm very sympathetic, for lack of a better word, to the public safety mission, because they really need to move in this direction and they've got a lot of problems to solve and I thought I could help. So we've been working at this and the, the, it's now part of the uh, Center for Advanced Communications. Um, your tax dollar and mine is helping to fund a lot of this research in several areas, public safety being one. Um, so the work we did about, it's actually been two years ago, I, uh, this conference made me realize how long it took to get the report out. So I have nothing to, to his three months is good. Um, we did a bunch of studies uh, on the university campus in a uh, typical office building was one of them. And the other was the, uh, well it's the basketball arena. It's the Coors Event Center on campus for a public space. I'll sum this up really quickly. And by the way, it just coincidence, if you happen to watch the Republican debate tomorrow night, that will actually be held in the building where we did our tests. I don't know if they'll show you any of the building or not. For me, I'll be watching the World Series, but uh, I've been in the building, I've been all over that building. But 